Welcome to this first of six videos on the digestive system. This time we'll be looking at the overview of the system itself, components of food and what has to happen to the food in order to get it to come into the system, the mouth, what goes on in the mouth, and swallowing. I'd like you to think of the digestive system in this fashion. If this represents the body, the digestive system is really just a tube that runs through the body. Open on both ends. The mouth is where we put the food. The digestive system treats the food and what it can't use comes out the anus. The reason I want to start this way is because I want you to think about when food is actually inside the body. When you put it in your mouth, is it in the body then? Or is it just in your mouth? And then you swallow it. Is it in the body when you swallow it down to your stomach? Is that in the body? Or is that just in your stomach? Think of it like this. Here's some food. It's in the digestive tube. It's halfway through the digestive tube, so really this food would be sort of in your small intestines. Is that food in your body, or is it just in your small intestines? The answer? The answer really is, it's just in your small intestines. It's not in the body yet. It's not in the body until it actually crosses membranes and gets into cells. And if you think about it, the food that you put in your mouth is way too big to cross membranes, way too big to go into cells. So when it's in your mouth, or in your stomach, or in your small intestines, it's really not in the body yet. It's just inside this tube. It's still connected to the outside. Secondly, I'd like to consider what's in the food itself. If we look at food biochemically and consider the components of it. Food is made out of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, Vitamins, minerals, and water. That hamburger you put in your mouth or that salad you put in your mouth is really a combination of a bunch of chemicals. All of these chemicals are too big to get into cells. All of them except these ones. These ones don't need to be digested. Your digestive system has to manage to take these things apart, molecule by molecule. Vitamins, minerals, and water sometimes are locked up inside the food, so digestive action is required to release it so it can be absorbed, but no chemical digestion occurs for these items here. We know that carbohydrates, biochemically, we eat starch. Well, starch is just a polymer of glucose. And the digestive system has to take the starch and break it down into glucose molecules, and the glucose can then be absorbed. Glucose is small enough it can go into cells. Similarly, lipids have to be broken down into fatty acids, and glycerol. And by the same token, amino uh, proteins are way too big to get into cells. They have to be broken down into their component molecules, which are amino acids. Nucleic acids, chromosomes, if you like, these things have to be broken down into nucleotides 
And nucleotides themselves are still too big. They have to be broken down even further into their components, which are sugars, bases, and phosphates. These items, glucose, glycerol, fatty acids, amino acids, and the sugars, bases, and phosphates that make up the nucle nucleotides are all small enough to get out of the digestive system. I have a better picture of the digestive system than that one. I'd like to show you this one. And I've already got some parts labeled on it. The digestive system, like we said, is just a tube that runs through the body. It has a mouth on this end. You can follow the tube all the way through. The anus is here. All of this chemical activity that occurs in digestion has to occur along this tube. Nothing is in the body till it gets out of that tube. In this particular video, we'll only be considering what goes on in the mouth, as far as physical and chemical digestion here, and swallowing will stop at the cardiac sphincter. Mouth, pharynx, esophagus, cardiac sphincter, this is the stomach, trachea, epiglottis. Digestion in the mouth. When we put food in our mouth, we chew it. Chewing quite simply is physical digestion. Our teeth crunch it up into smaller pieces. What we're basically doing is increasing the surface area of the food. The reason it's important to increase the surface area of the food is because if you're going to get chemical activity going along, enzymatic activity, the enzymes have to get at surfaces for them to work on. So if you take the carbohydrates, the starches, to get that into glucose molecules, the actual enzymes have to combine with the chemical structures that would take them apart. So the more surfaces that are exposed, the better off that process is going to be, the more efficient that process is going to be. It's worth considering teeth for a quick second. We do have four different kinds of teeth in our mouths. We've got our incisors, which are our front teeth for, for cutting. We have our canine teeth, which are the fang-like teeth. We have premolars and molars. And most of the crunching of our chewing action occurs by the molars. In the mouth also we have a tongue. And the purpose of the tongue quite simply is to roll the food around because if you keep chewing in the same spot all the time you'll never get it chewed into smaller pieces all it does is keep crunching the same space so the tongue has to manipulate the food move it around in the food so that you can actually get new pieces to crunch on so the tongue has that role there's also sal sal salivary glands There's three pairs of salivary glands, a couple underneath the tongue here, and there are other ones on the side of your mouth. And what they do is secrete saliva. Saliva is mostly water, but there's also an enzyme in it. The enzyme is salivary amylase. This enzyme is one of two amylase enzymes in the digestive system. This one works on starch. So, go back to what we had with the parts of food, the components of food. We take our carbohydrates, consider the starches. We have to start breaking them down chemically. Starch is a polymer of glucose, 
glucose combined into two unit pieces, that's maltose, salivary amylase will take starch and break it into maltose. I'll just put S amylase here. So by the time you swallow it, if you chew your food well enough, you should be able to start tasting the maltose. It's a malt sugar. None of the other things in food, none of the proteins, none of the lipids, none of the nucleic acids, none of those things are broken down in the mouth except physically. The increased surface area, the exposure to the different parts of them is there, but they're not chemically taken apart. So then you go ahead and you're ready to swallow the food. Now, swallowing requires an action of the tongue. The tongue not only moves food around in the mouth, there it is, not only moves food around in the mouth, but also pushes it back to the back of your tongue. And swallowing is a reflexive action. You get things back there, it's almost like the gag reflex. It's a reflexive action, and you, auto, you automatically swallow. I mean, that's one of the roles of the tongue. When you swallow the food, it's really not food anymore. It's now called bolus. And bolus really is quite simply about the same thing as a ball of food. But think about it. If you looked at bolus, you wouldn't want to eat it. It doesn't look like food. It's been chewed up. Some of the chemical activity started to take place. It's chemically altered, and it's just a little ball of food, and you swallow all the time. And that ball of food goes down your esophagus. So swallowing food is initiated by the tongue when it puts it at the back of your mouth. It's a reflexive action. Automatically, you start to swallow. And if you think now, We've got a tube, we're not going to draw the mouth, but here's our tube. This is our esophagus going down like that. The walls of this tube have got four layers. Outside layer, I'll draw it this way. There's four layers there. The outermost layer is a serosa layer. It's just the outer skin. Inside that is a muscular layer. Inside that one is a submucosa. And the innermost layer is the mucosa layer. The food stuff that you swallow, the bolus, is in here. The part of the digestive tube that comes in contact with it is the mucosa, called mucosa because it secretes mucus all the time. Digestive activity requires a lot of water. There's a lot of water in mucus. That's where it comes from. Outer skin, muscle layer, submucosa, mucus water secreting, mucus secreting layer. This one, we don't have to consider too much, it's just the outer skin. This one has two layers. There's a circular layer and a longitudinal layer. And it's the combined action of these two layers of muscles inside that layer there. Those, those two muscle, muscle layers, that when the circular muscle contracts, it constricts when the longitudinal muscles contract, they actually shorten. So you get this combined action of constriction and shortening. Constriction, shortening. The ball of food here, the bowl is here. Constriction. It constricts here, it shortens, and what happens is it slowly pushes that ball of food down. 
by constricting, shortening, constricting, shortening, like that. That action is called peristalsis. Peristalsis, quite simply, is the combined muscle action of circular and longitudinal muscles that force materials along the digestive tube and along other tubes in the body as well, in other systems even. This action occurs not only in the esophagus here for swallowing, also in the intestines. It's how the material gets moved all the way along. So peristalsis is extremely important. It stops though, down here, I mean it, it stops. There's a muscle constriction at the bottom of this esophagus. If this is the stomach, here, there's an extra tight circular muscle here. It is called the cardiac sphincter. And when it relaxes, material can go into the stomach. When it constricts, that prevents stomach acid from regurgitating back up an acid reflux, things like that, right? Thank you for watching this video on the digestive system. Be sure to tune in to video number two where we'll deal with what goes on in the stomach and how the stomach is specially designed for its functions. Thanks again.